Welcome everyone to Hot Science at Home. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Science Institute is proud to bring you the latest and coolest advancements in science through Hot Science at Home. And please join me in welcoming Professor Chris Kirk, our special guest. Welcome, Dr. Kirk. How are you tonight? I'm great. Thank you. It's good to be back, as it were. Welcome back. Dr. Kirk, let me give you the briefest background about him. He's the professor of anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin. He studies primates that are related to humans, and his research helps us understand human evolution. Dr. Kirk has won many awards for his engaging approach to teaching, and some of which we'll get a glimpse of tonight. If you read his student reviews of his courses, they rate Dr. Kirk as, quote, awesome, hands down the best professor at UT, truly amazing, and I love this man. So what the heck is an II anyway? Jay, I'm glad you asked. Um, next slide, please. This is an II. Uh, IIs are easily one of the coolest and most interesting and also weirdest animals on the planet. First things first, IIs are primates. Primates uh, is the group of mammals that includes you and me, as well as apes and monkeys, and things like you know lemurs and lorises and bush babies. An II is a very specialized type of lemur. It's only found in Madagascar. Uh, it's arboreal. It uh, is nocturnal. It only comes out at night. And if you look at this picture of an II, you know, it really doesn't take an expert in comparative anatomy to see that this is a really bizarre and unusual animal. I mean, look at those sort of shiny, leathery bat ears. But if you want to catalog all of the, the weird and cool and amazing features of eye eyes, you should probably start with the hands. So if you look at the upper right of your screen, you'll see a close up of an eye eye hand. And first things first, you'll notice that all the digits are tipped by claws. And this is really weird for a primate. You know, most primates are like you and me. We've mm -hmm. got nails instead of claws on our digits. But eye eyes have basically said, no, nah, no thanks, I don't need nails, I'm gonna re-evolve claws, so that's weird. But then I'm sure everybody by now has noticed this long, skinny, almost skeletal, highly mobile middle finger. And uh, so, all right, I'll tell you what that's all about in a second. First, let me show you sort of exhibit B on II bizarreness. If you look at that, the lower right of your screen, you'll see a view of the skull of an II. And if you look at its teeth, you will notice that its incisors, its front teeth, are ever growing and chisel shaped, just like, just like a, a beaver or something like that. And it's in fact this feature that led the first French naturalists uh, to see eye eyes uh, and study their anatomy. It led, they, it, this feature led them to incorrectly conclude that eye eyes are rodents and mm. not primates. So um, that's, that's an eye eye. And, and okay, I should probably tell you what all of these bizarre features are about. Yeah. Uh, but the first thing that you need to know is that eye eyes, more than anything else, love to eat grubs of wood boring insects. Let me just give you a quick description before I show you a few short video clips. Um, it's called percussive foraging. What an eye eye will do is it will listen with its ears as it moves along uh, a tree trunk or dead wood or something like that, tap, 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 tapping with that middle finger. And uh, what they're doing is they're listening for the spaces that have been that have basically been bored by those wood boring grubs, or maybe they're listening for the sounds of little mandibles of those grubs chewing away at the wood. So check out this first video. So there you go, this is slowed down. This hmm. is percussive foraging by an eye eye. The eye is sniffing and listening and tapping along the trunk. The next thing that happens is uh, when the eye eye finds a void underneath the wood, it's gonna deploy those ever growing chisel shaped front teeth to bore into the wood and open up a hole. So hmm. have a look at the next. So there you go. Hmm. I mean, they're you know beaver style chewing through wood. And then the final step of this amazing adaptation, their suite of adaptations that is percussive foraging, uh, is that once a hole is opened up, the long, highly mobile skinny finger goes into the hole and the claw hooks a grub and pulls it out. So take a look at the final clip. So there, are the, <laughs> there were the incisors viewed from the inside. There's a grub getting hooked by that terrible middle finger. And oh, did you see the look on his face? He's like, oh, it's so delicious. Get to that one more time. <laughs> Here it comes. Oh, all right. Well, that's fine. So that, oh, that's, that, an eye eye. that's so cool. But why are we talking about eye eyes and their eyes? And what do eye eyes have to do with us humans? 
Okay, well, first things first, I needed a good title for the talk. And, and uh, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a lemur nerd. I love lemurs and I love IIs. But um, it, the idea was this. Um, IIs and humans are pretty different, right? I mean, what could be more different from us than an animal that lives in a forest at night in Madagascar, runs around up in the trees and chews through wood in order to extract grubs out of, out of the wood? I mean, and nevertheless, IIs, and humans and all other living primates share a fundamental similarity of their visual system. So here's an image of an eye, eye on the top and a typical human at the bottom. And uh, one thing that you will notice when you look into the face of a primate, eye, eye, human or otherwise, is that they've got some fundamentally similar and really unusual features of their visual systems. And let, let me give you a hint by showing you a few other non-primate mammals. Okay. Okay, so oh. these are perfectly respectable mammals, right? Mm -hmm. There's a bunny rabbit, a squirrel, and a cow. Sure. Everybody at home who's looking at this can see what the difference is, right? Mm -hmm. You look into the face of a primate, the primate looks back at you with two forward-facing eyes, just like your own. In fact, next slide. This is something that you see across the primate order, whether we're talking about Professor McConaughey, whether we're talking about that bush baby at the bottom, uh, whether we're talking about any kind of monkey or ape, we've all got forward facing eyes. And you know, you and I are so used to seeing other humans with forward facing eyes. It's easy to forget how truly unusual this is. There aren't that many other animals that have eyes that, that face the same direction as ours and other primates. Hmm. Yeah, the squirrels, the rabbits, the eyes face outward. So the primates are different from most other mammals that way. How does that help us understand our own human vision? Um, well, next slide, please. Um, if you've got forward facing eyes, this gives you a wide field of binocular vision. Binocular just means two eyes. And let me demonstrate uh, 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 this by showing you a diagram. Let's pretend that we're looking down on uh, Regijan Page's uh, uh, eyes from above, so you can see his left eye at the bottom and his right eye at the right. And uh, Next slide, please. Here's the region of space that's viewed by the left eye. Next slide, please. There's the region of space overlapping viewed by the right eye. And I've got the binocular visual field labeled. Remember, binocular means viewed by both eyes simultaneously. And what this means is that most of the space in front of a human's head or any primate's head is going to be seen simultaneously by both eyes. So let's say that Ray Jean goes to Madagascar and he sees an eye eye in a forest at night. And it almost doesn't matter where you put that eye eye in front of his head. Next slide, right? Move to the left, the right. It's almost always going to be seen by both eyes simultaneously. It's only, next slide, for things that you can see that are way out in the far visual periphery that are only viewed by a single eye. And we're so, most of us are so used to seeing things with two eyes simultaneously, we don't even think about the fact that we do that. Right. So Rege, uh, AKA the Duke of Hastings, apparently he has a large binocular field of view. Yeah. Can we tell how big our own binocular field is? Yeah, it's super easy to demonstrate. And everybody at home, if you want to, you can try this. So all you have to do is cover up one eye or close one eye, bring your finger over to where it disappears behind the bridge of your nose, then close the other eye, bring your other finger over to where it just disappears behind the bridge of your nose, and then open both eyes and look straight forward and realize that everything that you're seeing between your hands is in your binocular visual field. It's viewed by both eyes at the same time. And it's only the stuff that's way out in the far periphery that you can't see very well anyway, that's monocular and only viewed by one eye. That's really neat. So we humans, primates, we have a large binocular field of view. What's it good for? Uh, yeah, well, there's a, probably a really good functional explanation for this. Next slide. So it turns out that binocular vision is absolutely critical for making fine depth judgments. And it doesn't matter whether you're catching a ball or throwing darts or just reaching for the handle of a coffee mug, right? If you want to use your vision to judge how far away something is in space from your head or your body and guide your hand toward it, mm -hmm. you need binocular vision to do this very precisely. And I could tell you that and just say, take my word for it. But instead, I want to show you a few great videos that come from UT alumna 
and current professor of anatomy at the Keck School of Medicine at USC, Dr. Addison Kemp. And let me just tell you what she did first, because this is amazing. She went to the Duke Lemur Center, uh, where they've got a great and amazing assortment of, of living lemurs that are often in captive breeding programs and very well cared for. And uh, uh, what she did is she made these little teeny helmets for them. That's right, I said little teeny helmets. And, and then what she had is a test apparatus where she had them leaping from pole to pole with little helmets on. So take a look at the next video. So what you have here, again, there's a fat-tailed dwarf lemur, there's a tiny little lemur, and it's doing what lots of lemurs do. It's leaping from pole to pole. She set it up so that it was had to move from one side of this enclosure uh, to get to a food reward. And this is a typical, you know, leap, right? Uh, these, uh, a lot of arboreal primates are very acrobatic. They're very good at nailing these leaps. And I don't know how, I don't know if you guys can see it well enough. It's pretty small in this image, but it is in fact wearing that little helmet. Okay, well next what she did is she made a new set of helmets where she covered up one eye once they knew how to do this task. And then she ran them through the, the same test apparatus and you can imagine what happened next. Next slide. So now this lemur has one eye covered up, it leaps and- Oh. Uh, fail. Okay, first oh. things first. First things first, no lemurs were harmed in making this video. That's a good <laughs> short drop. The floor is covered with foam. And, okay. and to be fair, this sort of an adverse result only happens something like one in every 50 leaps. So most of the time the lemur could nail it even with one eye covered. However, compared to having both eyes uncovered, they did significantly worse <laughs> at nailing their landings. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go to the next slide, let me show you the most common adverse outcome in this experiment. So the lemur goes to leap, it's a short leap, and you can see, oh, <laughs> right, booped on the snoot, right? So the lemur leaps, and it misjudges the distance and it hits its poor ickle little nose against the pole. So this lemur is doing the same thing that you or I would do if we were gonna leap from one vertical pole to another one-eyed and we weren't exactly sure how far it was, we would overcorrect by jumping too far. So <laughs> there's your, you know, your practical demo if you ever needed one about the importance of binocular vision for judging distances very precisely. Huh, those lemurs are pretty yeah, okay, well, listen, you, you, can, you can say those lemurs were doing a terrible job, uh, but I I'll tell you right now, humans do just as poorly uh, under similar conditions, similar experiments. You don't have humans leaping from pole to pole, but something I often have my students do in class is something that everybody at home can do. If you have something like a flat tip pen or a, an unsharpened pencil, something that you can basically set down in front of you on a coffee table or whatever, and just have it sit there. You can't hold it for this experiment, it has to be set down. So you can see that Jay is setting up his. Um, and and the, the trick is this, your, your target, your visual target's gonna be directly in front of you. You're gonna cover up one eye. You're gonna put your finger like this. You're gonna come out to the side and you're gonna bring your finger in. And you are gonna do this very simple task of bringing your finger in and touching the tip of the pen or whatever it is. You guys can see how well Professor Banner is doing. You should, okay. <laughs> if you're curious, you should all try this at home because it's really easy to demonstrate. Students are always amazed at how terrible we are at hitting the nail right on the head uh, when we are deprived of binocular vision and we're only using one. All right, you finally got it, good job. One, one in eight is <laughs> my right. percentage. That's pretty typical. <laughs> okay, well, um, I guess you've helped me prove to myself that I shouldn't be dissing lemurs because we're all in the same boat and relying on this wonder of binocular vision. Well, why then would primates need such good depth perception that this bino vision gives us? Yeah, you know, there's actually a, a, a pretty decent literature on this that goes back decades. Next slide. Um, the old idea and the very plausible idea was that forward facing eyes originally evolved in order to give a wide binocular visual field so that you have a, a large region of space uh, where you've got excellent depth perception specifically that allow you to move around in the trees. So take, for example, this picture of a Varose shafaka in Madagascar. It's another type of lemur. Uh, that's the study animal of UT alumna, or excuse me, hot science alumna, um, uh, Dr. Becca Lewis. And at, at the right of the screen, 
you can see an image of, of a shafaka doing what shafaka do, right? And, and most arboreal mammals, excuse me, most arboreal primates have to do something like this at one point or another. If you're gonna move from limb to limb or tree to tree, you have to leap. And you can imagine if you have sort of judged the distance to your target where you're gonna land, but you don't hit it right on the money, this is gonna be a problem for you. You're gonna follow the tree, you're gonna break a leg, a is gonna eat you, something like that. And, and everybody thought, okay, well, you know, problem solved. Now we know why primates have forward facing eyes. And in the 70s and 80s, people started saying, hey, wait a second, what about squirrels? What about the fact that most arboreal mammals don't have forward facing eyes? We don't see them falling out of the trees all the time. What's going on? Right. And so the narrative anatomists were like, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. It must be something else that accounts for primates having forward facing eyes. And the way you, in, in this sort of comparative science, when you get into this sort of a conundrum, one way you can solve your problem is by saying, all right, who outside of primates has got forward facing eyes? What other types of animals have independently evolved forward facing eyes? And what do they use them for? And if you think about this for just a hot second, most of you, if I say, what other mammals, but what other animals besides primates have got forward facing eyes? Most people, next slide, would pretty quickly come up with cats and owls. That's right, cats and owls. They've independently evolved forward facing eyes like primates. They also have a wide field of binocular vision within which they can make very precise depth judgments. And if you then say, all right, well, what are cats and owls using their forward facing eyes for, right? Why do they need to have excellent depth perception? Well, most cats and owls do, they, 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 they acquire their prey in a very similar way. Number one, they uh, hunt mainly at night. Number two, they visually fixate on their target before they, they get it. So in other words, they judge the distance before they strike. And then critically, number three, they reach out with an appendage. So I don't know if you guys saw, and if we could go back to that previous slide, um, at, at the bottom, um, is that possible? It's okay if it's not possible. Everybody's seen a cat reaching out with a paw. So bottom left, a cat reaching out with a paw to snag a juicy little mouse. And in particular, I wanted you guys to see at bottom right, the owl right at the moment where it strikes the rat. Its eyes are locked on target and the terrible talons are going in to do their business. And I think there's actually a very nice video clip coming up next of cats doing their thing. So this is a, a video of a cat in Japan where the owner likes to suspend the, the mouse toy from the ceiling and the cat leaps to get it. And okay, so that deserves a replay, right? So the cat leaps, look at that, eyes are locked on target, distance is assessed, and the paw is deployed to bat the mouse out of the way. If you performed the way, with all due respect, Professor Banner did in trying to hit the end of the pen, when you did this, you'd miss it. And if you're, you know, if you're a wild cat of any kind or an owl, you would go hungry. And so what some of you are probably now thinking in the audience is, okay, that's all well and good, but most primates don't hunt prey. And I would agree with you, you know, gorillas don't hunt prey usually. Some primates do, but if you go back to the last common ancestor of primates, let's say about 66 million years ago, you would find a small nocturnal predator, just like some nocturnal predatory primates today. Take a look at this. If you then say, all right, let's look at primates that, uh, that, that, that eat a lot of bugs and other arthropods and things like that. How do they get their prey? The answer is it's something functionally very analogous to what the cats and the owls were doing. That is, they reach out into space in front of them using their eyes to guide their hands and they snatch the prey with their hands. So uh, at the left of your screen, you see two images of the tiny terror of the Indonesian rainforest at night. That is a tarsier. And at bottom left, you can see a tarsier coming in for a landing. Its eyes are locked on target. And these freaky big man hands that tarsiers have are being <laughs> deployed to snatch, you know, the Katie did. At upper right, that's not even nocturnal primate. But squirrels, mo squirrel monkeys eat a lot of insect prey. And you can see this particular squirrel monkey is reaching out with a hand in order to grab a stick insect. And in the bottom right, you can see a slender loris in South Asia reaching out with its hand to grab a lizard that it's gonna eat. And in every case, primates need their forward facing eyes and excellent depth perception to guide their hand in order to make that capture. You know, a lot of the time, the prey does not want to be eaten and will try to evade. So it makes sense to have this big region of space in front of your head where you know very precisely the distance to objects. And so, I, if I could leave everybody with, with a thought, it's this. When you're brushing your teeth later tonight and you look in the mirror, 
and you see your forward facing eyes, I want you to remember number one, that's really pretty weird that we have those forward facing eyes, right? That's most mammals don't look like us. It's just primates and cats and a few other groups. Uh, the second thing I want everybody to remember is, okay, so our forward facing eyes may be good now for things like snatching Frisbees out of midair, uh, but the evolutionary backstory is really interesting. This is a feature that's present in all primates because it evolved a long time ago in animals that were small nocturnal predators that needed to snatch prey with an appendage. Wow. wow. That is so, so cool. cool. Cheers. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, well, uh, I think we, we should do is uh, go to our audience and we'll have some Q&A if you're ready, Dr. Sure. Kirk. Thank you so much for that. That is just some fascinating stuff. Thank so you. let's see, uh, Roger uh, tells us it's, uh, hello, it's just after one o'clock in the morning here in the UK. So Roger is in the early lead for whoever is, uh, you know, ask a question from the furthest distance away from Austin, Texas. I think Roger's got this one tied up. It's one in the morning here in the UK, so I'll probably head for my bed before the end of the event. I hope it goes well. But uh, Roger hung in there, and Roger has a question for us. And Roger says, but birds seem to do well without binocular vision. So Roger, that is a really good point, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, if you go into the old anatomical literature, it's really common to encounter statements that only primates have got binocular vision or only some mammals, including primates, have got binocular vision. It turns out that when you go out and you measure the size of the binocular visual field, almost everybody has even at least a tiny little slice of their total visual field, everything they can see, that's binocular and that includes animals like rabbits. You know, rabbits have got eyes that face totally laterally, sideways, but there's this narrow, tiny little, you know, high slice of space um, in of its face that allows it to, within that tiny little region of its visual field, uh, precisely judge uh, distances to targets. And so we're not so much uh, unusual in having some binocular vision, it's that most of our vision is binocular and most other, most other, you know, uh, vertebrates with two forward face or with two eyes, um, like birds, have got um, some amount of binocular overlap. They just don't, most of them don't have as much as primates do. I hope that answered the question. Yes, uh, yeah, it surely does. So, um, Roger, and uh, next question will come from uh, Richard K. Both watching on YouTube, the streaming uh, YouTube, but people who are watching this stream on Facebook, um, you're getting outpaced by the people watching on YouTube. So time for you guys to come forward with your questions from Facebook. Or, and, and here Richard K. asks, well, how about sloths with their forward-facing eyes? I'm going to guess that this is my former PhD advisor, Richard K. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about this a lot, and, and sloths have come up before. And one thing that I would say is, yeah, sloths. What do we do about sloths? Uh, my witty my, my rejoinder would be, well, first we actually need to go out and measure the size of the sloth binocular visual field, as well as its eye orientation. It turns out that the last person to go out and systematically measure eye orientation and binocular field overlap uh, in a wide range of mammals did this, uh, I think it was 1901. And so, and so but, but before we say anything about sloths, we would want to collect data. That being said, you know, you may very well be right that sloths, or sloths as the British call them, have got a, a large binocular visual field. If so, I don't really know what that would be about. Um, I, I suppose it's possible that uh, uh, sloth crania, their heads, are pretty unusual in, in having a very short snout. Maybe there uh, is is a side effect of snout retraction. But I, maybe maybe the larger the larger point to make from all of this is wow! I would love I would love to have more data on on who has what. I'd love to be able to tell you. Well, I know exactly how many degrees of binocular visual field overlap sloths have, but but I don't unfortunately. Maybe we should write a paper. <laughs> there you go. Questions are often the, great, the greatest thing to spur new research. Well, our next question comes from Jahamlet, and he or she asks, when did you start becoming interested in vision and eyes? 
You know, I'm I, I, honestly, I'm not sure. I've always been interested in anatomy. And I, I think back to a paper that I wrote or a class that I was taking when I was an undergraduate at UT many years ago. And I was just thinking about this a few weeks ago. I, I realized that I had written this paper. Um, my, my now colleague, um, Dr. Liza Shapiro, had given us this assignment where we had to write a mock NSF grant for it to, to fund a project. And I remembered that I, I, my, my proposed NSF grant that I came up with, you know, this was never submitted, it was just a class project, was to study the effects of hearing, vision, and smell in primate locomotion. <laughs> so I, I, I guess that's not, maybe not the best answer to the question, but I, I think these ideas have been percolating for a long time. And, you know, one thing that I love about the anatomy of the entire primate head is that it's so complicated. There's so many different things going on. I mean, just the retina in the back of the eye is so incredibly complex with all the different cell types and how they're the connected and the different functional roles that they have. But then you consider the head as a whole. There are all of these different competing things that are going on in a primate head. You need space for a brain. You need space for a masticatory apparatus to be able to chew up food and swallow it and digest it efficiently. And then, you know, close to our mouth, we're going to shove all these major sense organs in, smell, vision, hearing, you know, we've got the delicate sense of touch all over our face. And I think I've always been fascinated by eyes as one of the major functional modules that has to somehow fit in the head, right? You, so, I mean, maybe it makes sense that my almost non-answer to Richard Kay's question was, well, maybe the snout gets smaller and that affects, you know, the way right. <laughs> right. Well, that was a, a great whirlwind tour of, of the head and how everything in it is so important for us as creatures. But with the eye eyes, I'd like to go a little bit and, and talk about those crazy fingers, those hands that, and that long, skinny middle finger. And was this obvious to the researchers who first discovered and described this species or did this go like as a mystery for a while? What's, what's the history of inquiry about that really crazy middle finger? That is such a great question. I wish I had an answer for you. I don't know off the top of my head who the first ecologist was that actually observed eye eyes in the wild doing what eye eyes do. They are fiendishly difficult to see uh, in the wild in Madagascar today. Um, I, you, you can go see them at the Duke Lemur Center <laughs> if you find yourself in the vicinity of Durham, North Carolina. Uh, they've got probably the most successful captive breeding program in the world. But in Madagascar, they're very cryptic. They're critically endangered. And, you know, I, Jay, I really should know who is the first person to figure out, like, oh, this is what IIs do. But I, I don't have an answer to that question. What I have heard, but never confirmed, is that this joint, right, the metacarpophalangeal joint where the finger meets the, the rest of the hand uh, for that middle finger, that it's more akin to a ball and socket joint that's like our shoulder joint in that it can move in all sorts of different directions. And if, if for anybody who's interested in eye eyes, and let me be honest, everybody should be interested in eye I said it. <laughs> Everyone should be like opening up, as soon as we're done, of course, opening oh, up right. videos and searching for eye eye videos you'll see footage of eye eye fingers going down these channels where, you know, BBC photographers and others is sliced off an edge of a log and they can see the grub and they can see the channels that the grubs have, uh, have, have bored through the wood. And you can see the finger going around, sort of turning backwards around corners, <laughs> seeking out the grub. It's, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal to watch. And I, I know you're, you're just demonstrating that middle finger thing and that you, you mean no, no ill will towards me in waving that around. Definitely uh, not. But it really, it's the like, eye the, eye, the way. yeah, the eye, right? <laughs> it, it's really like they're, they're born with a, a stud finder, right? Is <laughs> what they're doing. Like we try to hang a picture or something, you just tap, tap, tap on the wall to find. It's, yep. it's remarkable. Okay. I love the hang picture analogy because uh, my father, most of the time that I was growing up, was an artist and he would often paint wildlife art on these very big sheets of marble. I right. guess he got drafted to help him hang things. <laughs> you know, we'd be working with a 200 pound piece of marble and it would have, you know, six hangers on the back. And the first thing we'd have to do is beat on the wall to find the studs. <laughs> and the next thing we would have to do, and this was the hardest part, 
You'd be looking for one side, have it on the wall, trying to get the hanger on the hook, and it would miss. And I was like, why is it so hard to get those hooks on, those hangers on the hooks? It's impossible. And I realize now it's because I was trying to do a fine depth task with using monocular vision. Oh, interesting. Terrible it goes, it goes all the way back to your childhood. That's crazy. We have a question from um, Jagruti Dave who asks, what makes primates and other animals with eyes in front of the face able to see so much? Um, well, gosh, um, one thing that I could say about primate vision, Jagruti, is that if, if you start comparing primates very generally with other sorts of animals in terms of what they can do with their vision, primates as a group tend to have pretty good visual abilities in terms of you know, your visual acuity, your ability to see details, you know, how many lines could you read off of an eye chart at the eye doctor's office. Primates tend to do better on those sorts of experiments than lots of other mammals. Um, but there's one group of primates in particular that uh, has got, oh, apparently I'm echoing, sorry everybody. <laughs> there's one group of primates in particular, the monkey apes and the humans, that has got phenomenally good vision. Um, and uh, that has to do with specialized anatomy of the retina that allows them, almost like having a computer monitor with, you know, many more pixels than a computer monitor with fewer pixels and having lower resolution. Um, this is called the antithroid monkeys and humans has got um, retinas that give them extraordinary visual acuity and ability to see visual details. And then there are even some groups of primates that evolve the ability to see three primary colors instead of two. Two or one is the norm for most mammals. And so, you know, in, in terms of seeing so much, there's a lot that's encompassed within that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, primates do differ from one group to the other, but I would say it's a whole suite of adaptations. It's adaptation, not just the eyes and the direction they faced. It's how crisp of an image can you form on your retina, right? It's what sort of a retina do you have to sample that image that you're forming there? And then critically, what kind of a brain do you have to process all of that visual input that's coming in? Most primates have got brains, and it's going to sound very reductionist, but if a primate brain is one thing, <laughs> it's many things, but it's one thing, it's a computer for dealing with visual information. Something like half of a typical primate's brain deals with processing visual input predominantly hmm. or exclusively. So basically from, from eyeball to brain, uh, primates have got loads of really interesting adaptations that allow them to have pretty phenomenal visual abilities. That's really neat. Uh, Pam Watson asks, what's the next research you would like to do with IIs? What question about them are you most curious about? Oh, wow. Gosh, I, uh, I Pam, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is one of my all-time favorite teachers. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> uh, uh, so, gosh, it's such a good question. I almost don't even know how to, how to answer it. You know what I'd love to do with IIs? I would love to look at their ears, and I would love to know more about their hearing. Um, I would, you know, there have been some estimates based on what's called an auditory brain reflex, where you basically put electrodes uh, on the head, and you're trying to measure the centers in the auditory brain for them that are responding to that. And that can give you a pretty good idea of what I eyes hear, but they're so dependent on hearing for that percussive foraging. I'd love to know more about their hearing abilities and what sorts of adaptations they might have that allow them to to you know, use that as a key part of their foraging strategy. Okay, great. The next question comes from uh, Becca Lewis, who asks, when did primates develop forward-facing eyes? I, okay, you, you almost never know for sure when you ask a question like that. It's always plausible, for example, that let's say the three, if we, we say there are three major groups of primates, tarsiers, Anthropoids, monkeys, apes, and humans, and uh, strepsirines, lemurs, and lorises. Maybe all three of those groups evolve forward facing eyes separately, right? Parallel evolution. It's always more parsimonious. It always, you know, it, it, it seems more plausible uh, to say that, you know, this is a pretty weird adaptation. It's a good bet that it had evolved by the time of the last common ancestor of living primates. And the real kicker there 
is that that last common ancestor of primates probably lived around 66 million years ago in East or Southeast Asia. We just don't have uh, a great fossil record from that time period for mammals in that particular place. So the earliest definite primates appear in the fossil record about, about 56 million years ago. And they've, they're already full-blown primates. They've got, uh, you know, they've got nails instead of claws. They've got forward-facing eyes. You can tell that from the anatomy of the skull. So we don't exactly have the fossils to say that it was there from the beginning, but it's probably a good bet that it was, which makes this a very, as I said before, a very ancient adaptation for, for humans and other primates. Wow, so that connects us to those creatures living in the trees, going after grubs. With that visual acuity, that connects us over 60 million years. That's awesome. Why are eye eyes called eye eyes? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I should know the answer to that. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe somebody can Google it and put it in the chat for us. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> So Chris, my, I, I, I guess is that it's a Malagasy name, but I'm not 100 okay. percent sure. Okay, I have to ask Chris. I'm I'm just curious. How did you get into science, anthropology? Is this something from the moment you were hanging uh, marble frame pictures that your dad made to, or was it a teacher, or was it a field trip? What experience or or people influenced you to go this career path? Are, are, are we in the circle of trust? Can I make a nerd? nerd yes, we, we are. <laughs> I remember being on the school bus in second grade, and everyone, we were talking about what we were going to do when we grew up, and someone would say, I'm going to be a fireman, and somebody else would say, I'm going to be a doctor, and I would say, I'm going to be an anthropologist. <laughs> and everyone would say, what is an anthropologist? The only reason I, okay, first things first, I have to give credit to my parents. My parents are the sorts of parents who not only encouraged lots of questioning, they were the sort of parents who would then follow up questions pre-internet days by trying to figure out the answer to a question that they didn't know. You know, the encyclopedia would come off the shelf. I'd ask mm -hmm. my, my dad, how do, how do plane wings work? How do planes go up in the air? The air? And he'd explain Bernoulli's principle to me and then we'd pull out you know, the, the encyclopedia, and then we'd make, you know, little mock airfoils and things like that. This is the context that I grew up in, asking lots of questions and, and, and learning a lot about science. And I remember I got interested in anatomy because uh, my mother is a neurotherapist. And I remember hanging out for long hours at her office with nothing to do but go through anatomy atlases. And so I just memorized anatomical features from an early age because it seemed really cool and interesting to me. But as far as anthropology in particular goes, my dad was an artist by trade, but he was an anthropology major at UT back in the day. I come from a long line of uh, UT alums. My grandfather was at UT in the, in the second half of the 1930s. And so because my dad was an anthro major, um, all of the different subfields of anthropology, sociocultural, linguistic, biological anthropology, archaeology, he was interested in all of them. So, you know, an, an archaeological exhibit on Mayan and Olmec art would come to the San Antonio Museum, we'd go. Um, uh, you know, a National Geographic would arrive at our door with, you know, new, cool, early human fossils in it, we'd read it. We dissect it together. You know, we'd walk through the forest together and he'd pick up a bone and he'd tell me what it was. Oh, this is a raccoon and it looks like a metatarsal or something like that. And so th this is, I think maybe uncharacteristically, this was just, this was just the context that I grew up in. And I was always fascinated by all of the things that are found in anthropology. That is a long answer to a question. You got me going down memory lane. But basically, um, um, when I was an undergrad at UT, I came in 1992, I knew I wanted to study anthropology. I didn't know what kind of anthropology. But two years later, I looked back on my classes and I thought, you know, this biological anthropology is pretty cool. I seem to be taking a lot of classes in this. And, you know, it, and my, some of my, you know, now colleagues, uh, then professors, were kind enough to let me into their graduate courses as an undergrad, probably because I pestered them a lot. Uh, and by the time I was done with undergrad at UT in 1995, um, I, I just knew that that's what I wanted to do for a living. I, I, could, I couldn't imagine wanting to do anything else. I just wanted to learn about functional anatomy and the primate fossil record and things like that. 
Wow. So you've been driven by curiosity and a persistence at pestering experts. Yeah, oh, yes. That is why your curiosity. This is, really, uh, this, is, this is advice that I give in office hours to my undergrads all the time. Go, go bug somebody. <laughs> go, go, what? They didn't respond to your email? Show up in office hours. <laughs> there you go. A great lesson for us all. Thank you so much, Professor Kirk, for a, a whwind tour of why we have such great vision that we do. It's it was my pleasure. great pleasure. Thank you, Dr. J, for the opportunity to speak. I love what you guys do. Well, everybody, if you want to find out about Professor Kirk and watch his full talk, it's archived on Hot Science Cool Talks. It's in over an hour. Uh, search for the talk. My eye, your eye, and the eye of the eye eye. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. See you, Chris. Bye. Thank you.